at the same time, I've sat at a lot of kitchen tables where there's two generations, and I'll put the proverbial coffee cup in the middle and say, I'm working for the farm. I'm not working for mom or dad. I'm not working for son or daughter. I'm working for the farm. And I think that brings some credibility to our group of what we do is that we're looking out for the best interests of the farm. Because there's pros and cons to both generations. But if I'm working for that business, this is where some of this stuff comes in. I also need to protect the business. You know, we've got some businesses the last five years that grew net worth a million dollars each year. If I did that 50-50 split, we're dumping a whole lot of equity on a young owner. That's a lot of responsibility. And then what if that young owner says, boy, I want that money out. I'm going to go farm on my own. That's a tough pill to swallow. You've got to write a check for a half a million dollars or a million dollars. have nothing to show for it except a management hole in debt. And we saw that more probably 20, 30 years ago um, where they were building some cow equity and taking the cows with them. Uh, but we've learned from those over the time to say, if I'm going to do something very aggressively with a new owner with this type model, I want to do some vesting. You know, we're going to do this paper transaction. We're going to have the annual report card. But you think you're going to leave with it in two years? Uh-uh. We're going to give it a haircut. And that's to protect the business. You know, so an example of this vesting is that first five years, you may be able to take zero with it. And the next five years is 10% a year, or excuse me, 20%, or no, we did six to 15. 10% a year until year 15 where you're fully vested. If I've been there 15 years, there's a higher likelihood I'm going to stay. The risk is in that beginning honeymoon space, so to speak. Voluntary withdrawal, somebody gets mad and leaves, maybe we give a 30% reduction. It's probably on the high side. Um, but I've got some attorneys that are comfortable with that second haircut, again, to protect the business. Somebody's doing poor performance. We're doing performance reviews versus expectations. You know, that, you know, this could go away. Put it right in the agreement. But, you know, based on non-performance, you're out. Yes? That's a tougher one because when I work with a senior generation, they're already vested. It's theirs. So I can get, if they get squirrely, we've seen it, if they get at least one haircut, and then where I put in payments over 20 years, at least I protected the business to say, Dad doesn't want $3 million and his third wife are going somewhere else. You know, it's that he's going to get the money monthly, monthly over 20 years just to protect the cash flow, because that's a hard one. It, you know, it's one, that's a business risk that you may not see coming. But again, if I do a long payment, it's, it's, he's entitled to it, it's his. Um, but if I do it over a long period of time, it less shock to the system. Poor performance, somebody, you know, isn't doing what they said they would, not showing up. Uh, junior generation gets squirrely, so to speak. You know, that the profit's interest could terminate. We could have that in the agreement. Um, and then I've got one that is a sliding scale. We've got a matrix. We've got a whole performance expectations that are laid out. And this uh, young generation could get 1% or 40% of the growth of that business based on his performance. And it's black and white. There's only a couple subjective numbers in there. And it's worked very, very well to help, you know, make a profitable business even more profitable because that's a pretty big motivating factor. In terms of the whole business transfers and the financing, the old equity and the new equity, I truly believe the three keys to success are time. This doesn't happen overnight. So the sooner you start, the better. It takes profit. You know, in my money in, money out world, and constant communication, both internal and external. Internal is with your partners and key employees. External is keeping everybody you're doing business with in the pertinent loop. You know, the feed guy doesn't know the, need to know the transfer stuff, and I don't need to know all the feed stuff, but making that constant communication is absolutely critical.
And then the time piece. You know, that's the other takeaway today is if you haven't done anything or started the conversation or know some people that haven't, press them a little bit. Because it's much harder when they're 80 years old and trying to do something versus, you know, in their 50s saying, I'm going to take leadership of this process. I've got good sons and daughters or key employees that want to be owners. The options are limitless, you know, and one size does not fit all. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of fairy tales written, um, but the financials are on the last page. And where do you start? You know, review your ideas with your key employees, your family, things that you want to start with, your business consultants, be it farm credit, farm net, or extension. There's a lot of good people out there that can help or want to help. Your income tax preparer and attorney are critical pieces of this puzzle. Um, especially if you're looking at that profits interest LLC that I talked about you need an attorney that's familiar with that concept because it's not mainstream and you need an income tax preparer for the same reason that understands that because there's some that don't um, and the process gets very expensive if you've got either one of those that don't understand you know you may have outgrown your accountant you may have outgrown your attorney as hard as that may be to say, um, I had one in Eastern New York, the cost of this process was three times what it should have been because the attorney just kept fighting the process. The family understood it very, very quickly. The attorney didn't. What's that? You haven't. <laughs> Megan might have. But change is good you know, sometimes for the benefit of the business. So I'd like to open it up to other questions. You know, I've kind of rambled a bit. I'm not sure where we are on time. Go ahead. Um, yep. Depends. If we're taking it as a draw or we're taking it at a guaranteed payment. I've got, if we're taking it as a draw, it's not deductible to the business and it's not taxable to you. You're eating up your equity account. So that's another planning tool is I get these LLCs set up, and there's some of the junior generation have figured this out, is the question was, you know, if I'm taking a big draw, what's the income tax ramifications? As you've got a business set up, you could take money out. We'll use the LLC, for example. You take money out as a draw, which is tax-free, but it's not deductible to the business. You just eat up your capital account, your old equity. Or you take a guaranteed payment, which is deductible to the business and taxed like a wage. So in some of these, now we're getting in the weeds a little bit, some of these, I will have the senior generation take a draw, eat up some of that old equity, and the junior generation will take a guaranteed payment and not eat into it at all. So we can maybe speed it up even more. So it depends on how it's labeled. Okay. Got five minutes. Yes. Yeah. It depends on because it's not just the capital count. There's a calculation off the. They got inside and outside basis. They want to know how much debt the business has. So it depends on the, the debt of the business. But generally, there's a step up in basis, and it's a pretty easy transaction. That's less risky than selling it at a negative and not having any debt to offset that. Yes? I see less land contracts than just a straight sale than when we did 20 years ago. Uh, the advantage of a land contract is they're typically easier to get back, but I don't recommend them. I like a mortgage in teeth just because things have become so much more litigious than where we've been. Just get a good attorney, get a mortgage on the farm. Uh, that's not to say you can't do a land contract. You can. It's just... I like 
the T's cross and the I's dotted, like I said earlier, farmers don't always make the best bankers. You know, and if the bank says no, FSA says no, you know, I've always said if three doctors tell you you're sick, you might be sick. So three banks, three banks have told you no, and then you hold the paper. Just be careful. I can speak for farm credit. Anything over 10 years, farm regulatory wise, requires a first mortgage. So the land contract is a kind of a blemish on the title. You might be pushed behind the bank. And I've, I saw that on the farm next door to where I grew up. The owner held the paper. You know, feed dealer, bank pushed them right out of the equity. That's why I, I've got a real life approach that I saw. People who are, did not work, but they just got nothing. Or they got to make a decision, you know, to say, is it time to cash that one out? And then you got the income tax versus, you know, spread it out over time, like Danny described, or pay it now. And you got to pick your poison. So that ties back to profitability. Does that make sense? First question back there, and then I'll come to you. The owner can hold the paper in a number of different ways. One of which is the standard same thing. The other is to hold the paper in the market. Then you don't own the land, you own the market. That's correct. Because you don't have to, you don't have to do anything if you have mortgage and control. Question? Do you ever use land trusts in combination with collateral uh, asset LLCs? And how does that combination impact farm credit involvement in financing that kind of transfer? As long as the trust documents say they can buy, borrow, and pledge, it's just a different person, so to speak. So it, it, it's manageable. The land trust thing to talk about, I'm just going to play on another little C because I am starting to see some movement on this, particularly in large businesses where these net worths are, in my opinion, out of control. That we've gone from $2 million net worth to $10 million to $20 million net worth. No reason in my mind that that's going to slow down where I talked about that internal leadership. I've got some families that are talking about to say, you know what, it makes no sense to do what John just described, generation after generation after generation. The number's too big, I don't need $20 million. So they'll take the real estate piece, set it out over here on a trust forever for the benefit of whoever's running that farm. I'm oversimplifying it, but it's pulling it off to the side where the cows and the equipment piece are all that I'm churning generation after generation or a portion of that. We've chunked that down because these net worths are big. Well, on average, they've been a lot bigger than where they were. The general is we if it's in there five years you, you're beyond the look back period so it's out of your estate forever 
well, depending on the trust, but uh, we're talking like legacy trusts, which I think is the same thing. Okay, I appreciate your time. Thank you.